Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to talk again to Yusuf Oxton. You are most welcome, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. It's good to be back. Thank you, Paul. It's great to, to see you again. Um, it was actually last April uh, that Yusuf first discussed uh, his uh, journey on Blogging Theology, and I thought it high time to invite him back on the channel to discuss his journey uh, in more detail. And just to uh, recap, uh, Yusuf, also known as Russell Ogston, was an ordained Anglican priest, in other words, a, a Church of England clergyman, for 12 years. After five years in parish ministry, he spent seven years of ministry in healthcare, working as a hospital, uh, hospital chaplain in East London and as a hospice chaplain in Kent. In 2010, he made the life-changing decision to embrace Islam and became a Muslim. Since then, he worked for a Quaker charity in London before retraining as an English language teacher. He married his Nubian Egyptian Yemeni wife and moved to Cairo. And after a year in Egypt, he moved to the Sultanate of Oman, where he has lived for uh, and worked for over 10 years uh, with his wife and two children. Now, in his own words, he once said, and I quote, Upon my embracing Islam, I realized the internal shift within me was spiritual, religious, and intellectual. It was an unexpected revolution of the heart and mind. Initially, I was a reluctant convert, trying my very best to remain within the Christian church I had loved and served for so long. However, we can only deny Allah's call for so long. Since my Shahada in 2010, the deepening and widening of my understanding, both of the religion and the world, goes on. I continue to be humbled by so many Muslims I meet on a daily basis. Alhamdulillah, he writes. End quote. A beautiful uh, quote there, which you give me permission to share. So can I just begin by asking you a bit more about your rather unusual upbringing, which involved a lot of travel? Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you, Paul. It's uh, great to be back again, and thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I, I, I had the, the fortune, if you like, of growing up. My, my father happened to be in the, the initially in the British Army, so we, we traveled quite extensively. Um, I've lived in Oman as a child, so uh, subhanAllah, I've come back to a country that I'd experienced as a child. I've also lived in Spain and Germany and many parts of the UK. And I think um, I'm quite grateful in a sense for my parents who were not particularly religious, um, but we had a very much an open, tolerant understanding of other cultures, other religions. Right other ways of living. And I, I think looking back, I, I'm mm. grateful for that um, early upbringing because I think that allowed me then through time to be exposed and to learn from other traditions, not just the Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. So now you, you've been living in um, Oman for how many years? Uh, 10 years. 10 years, uh, extra yes. extraordinary. Um, now tell us a bit more about your theological training mm. and the influences uh, in your, your thinking theologically. Yeah, so I think in my in my theological training to be a, an Anglican, a Church of England mm. priest, I, I trained in Birmingham, which, of course, as you know, is an incredible city, a multicultural city where there are many cultures, many religions living side by side. Mm. And whilst I was there, I belonged to the, the interfaith group. So we would visit Sikh gurdwaras, um, mosques, um, synagogues and so on. And I really enjoyed that, that interface with people from different religions um, mm -hmm. as a Christian. And, and of course, there I had many tutors, um, many great tutors at the time, one of whom was Robert Beckford, who is uh, quite a well-known black theologian mm -hmm. um, based in Birmingham. Um, yeah. And he really challenged me for the first time to look at alternative narratives and alternative theologies particularly from a black perspective. And that really challenged me to really look again. And one of my favorite phrases of unlearning in order to learn right. is to experience, like yeah. yeah, to experience the other. Uh, yeah. And so as a Christian, um, I began to really look again at my preconceived ideas and, and, uh, and beliefs. 
And that was further challenged when I traveled to South India uh, as, as part of my training. I went to Tamil Nadu Theological Seminary in Madurai, in Tamil Nadu. And, and there, of course, I was introduced to the whole idea of liberation theology, uh, most in particular looking at Dalit theology. And there again, I had some great theologians who mm. um, taught me, including a German a German theologian called Bas Verlenger, and, and, and again, um, quite a quite a well-known liberation theology uh, teacher at the time. Again, um, we explored the experience of um, Christians and others of color, um, those who are not white, who are not Western, and, and looking really at their experience of being a Christian in a minority country, but also looking at those, particularly a, a large number of Hindus from the mm. lower castes and the Dalits, of course, who turned, who turned to Christianity and Islam as a way of reclaiming um, their sense of identity and their sense of worth. And so that also really began to um, settle in my heart and mind many years before I became yeah. a Muslim. Astronomy. You mentioned you were at Birmingham. Did you ever come across yes. Professor John Hick, the, the famous Christian philosopher? He was, I think, I think I did. at Birmingham. Yes, I did. I, I studied yeah. at, um, at Birmingham University. I did my Bachelor of Divinity there. So I was in a very well known and very vibrant theology department. This was in the late 90s. Yeah. yeah. Um, so again, that was a really good experience, um, um, having seminars with some really interesting um, yeah. theologians. I mentioned him because he's a Christian theologian who was very much appreciative of other faith traditions, uh, yes. Islam. Yes. So um, sadly, he, he's no longer with us, but mm -hmm. I, I benefited from his books in the past. So um, you, you mentioned uh, to, to me, I, I think you had a, a mm. close a Bangladeshi Muslim friend. Mm. Uh, yes. uh, you know, what, what, what impact did she have on your, what life changing impact did you have on your life? Yes. So the, the irony, of course, is after after the wonderful experience of Birmingham, I, mm. I, I ended up uh, as a curate, as a newly ordained priest in the very conservative with a small C, a market town of Andover in Hampshire. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, where where it was very different, of course, from Birmingham. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I was uh, happened to be working alongside a, a, an evangelical uh, vicar at the time. And so we would have different uh, opinions about a number of uh, points of theology but but the 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 irony is in that context i happened to meet by chance a young uh, bangladeshi woman she came to the uk at the age of four and we met and and really that became a, a very life-changing experience for me over about a three-year period mm. where we became close and i remember watching her pray, um, watching her read Quran. She, she would have her Quran above uh, a wardrobe, high up as a, as a token of respect, bound in, in beautiful cloth. And I remember one incident where a member of her family had passed away in Bangladesh. And she, she got out of her Quran and she read the Quran and she made dua uh, and she was, she was crying. It was a very intimate moment. And I really began to recognize the experience of somebody of another faith and how profound and how deep uh, mm. that faith went. And, and also for the first time being alongside a person of color uh, and how that really plays out in so many micro moments mm. of, uh, of racism and Islamophobia, mm. which mm. certainly exists in, in the West. Mm. And so mm -hmm. she, she taught me a great deal, um, and I'm forever grateful for her. Oh, that's amazing. Are you still in touch with her today? Sadly not, sadly not. Many years have passed, but yeah. I, I remain thankful for really what was the, the first moment of getting up close and personal to Islam. Okay. Now, the, the next stage of your, your life uh, was your time as a hospital uh, chaplain in East London. So what, what is a chaplain? How does that differ from, say, a vicar or, or a curate, as you, you said you were before that? Yeah, so I, I left parish ministry and I was employed by the NHS, right. licensed by the, the bishop. And I worked full time in a very busy general hospital um, uh, in East London. Mm. And uh, that really... Uh, allowed me 
a great deal of freedom to offer religious, spiritual, pastoral care to anyone really who um, requested it. Mm -hmm. So that would be patients, staff and patients, uh, families. And so there was a real element of offering spe specifically religious care, for example, um, the sacraments, but also um, being a listening ear to patients right. as they try to explore issues around their own illness, um, a tremendous amount of social issues living and working in East London. Yeah. And uh, I know it's an overused phrase, but I, I did feel that I was at the cutting edge in many ways of, mm. of inner city urban ministry and, and working in healthcare at the time. And, and again, that's when I, over a five year period, I, I began to question much more deeply about systemic problems right. uh, around, around living in this very much aggressive consumerist, uh, neoliberal capitalist system. Well, very materialist, it's, it often yes. strikes materialist, isn't it, this system we live in in the West? Very, yeah. very much so. And, and, what, and, and I was meeting on a, on a daily basis so many people who had fallen through that system, right. who really had even fallen through the welfare system. Mm -hmm. And so they were at the mercy of the kindness of strangers. Mm -hmm. And so over a slow a period of time, I, I began to question how our society operates and the assumptions that we have around democratic society and the illusion in many ways of democracy. And I was seeing the victims of, of this very aggressive uh, capitalist system. And so again, without, without exploring Islam at the time, I just became increasingly more aware and frustrated that by remaining in this system as a chaplain, I, I was actually colluding, <laughs> colluding mm. in this system rather than helping. And, and I would have this phrase that I would often tell my colleague that I was extremely busy and I was getting burnt out. Um, and I was running around putting plasters on people's ax wounds. Um, mm. that, that's, that's how it felt as a chaplain, that there was, there was profound and deep inequality that I was experiencing um, within this setting. Mm -hmm. And so I, I began to really um, question how how Western societies operate. Mm. So do you think the Western church, the Western Christian church is, is somehow assimilated into this system as well? Yeah. So again, I, I began to see where where do I fit in as, as a mm. priest and where does the institutional church fit, fit into this society? And again, over time, I, I began to feel that the, that the church was was assimilating, was complicit in this very unequal system of, of economic and political governance. And I began to feel that the church was not really challenging or not challenging loudly enough um, this uh, assumption that this is the, the, the system that we should operate within. And so I, I almost felt like the church was had almost succumb or bow down to this, this very aggressive liberal secular um, system and, mm -hmm. and was no longer, I think, uh, of any relevance to a lot of people. And, and that's why I think many people have, have moved away from the institutional church and looked elsewhere for, mm -hmm. for meaning. Uh, and as you and I know, I think the numbers of young people, especially who are looking towards Islam, in the West is increasing quite rapidly. Mm. Uh, and I think what they're looking for is a, is a depth and a richness of, of spirituality and tradition that has remained on the whole, remained true to its heart. Uh, and so I, I often feel like the, the Christianity, dare I say, of the Church of England Mm. has become what I would call an anemic Christianity, mm. uh, a Christianity which no longer has the force um, of, of what they would call the good news of the gospel, um, mm. I think has been, has been lost by, by this overbearing, crushing agenda now that we have in the UK and other countries, um, a very much aggressive, secular 
agenda with, but, with capitalism at its heart. But is it not the case that the, these values you're, you're rightly concerned about are now encroaching upon Muslim countries uh, and, and the East in general? It's not just confined to the geographical borders of Britain, is it? it it's it's yeah. becoming global. Yeah, I, I, I spent a year in Egypt and I've been here 10 years and I, I do find particularly in the Gulf, I'm, I'm here in the south of Oman, I'm not far from Yemen, but, but even here, I think with with satellite TV, with globalization, social media, um, I, I do find now that that all pervasive notion of West is best um, is encroaching uh, within society in Eastern countries, not just Islamic countries, but I think the East generally. And, and I do worry for the future when I do see the, the incredible treasure and tradition of, of uh, Eastern countries, Muslim countries, somehow being, being watered down or, or being consumed by this consumerism, uh, the building of shopping malls, uh, and and the the you know explosion of social media has has positives, but also many negatives, and so I I, I do feel in some ways um, many countries in the East are sleepwalking into this Western consumerism without really really truly critiquing uh, mm. this system that they are now adopting. But is there not also another current at work here, uh, and this is more more to do with more recent events in in Gaza mm -hmm. and then the genocide, yes. and and the what many many people, particularly in the global south and in the west too now, are, are seeing as a complete double standards that the west talks about the international rule based order and human rights and democracy and and so on, whilst uh, giving political economic cover uh, to. Uh, what's going on in Gaza and actually supplying weapons that are killing people. I mean, I, I saw the terrible footage of a uh, it, 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 of, of a, a, an unarmed group of people with a, uh, holding a white a white uh, flag, a flag of yeah. surrender in in Gaza yesterday. Uh, and 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 the the man holding the flag was shot by the Israelis. And and this was all filmed by ITN, a British yeah. uh, a, a British camera crew. And um, the, the, our government was asked to condemn this as a crime, and they refused to do so. And I just mentioned that one I said as emblematic of, of the of this situation that although you're talking about the encroaching materialism and consumerism, certainly the shopping malls and the and the glamorous West <laughs> allegedly, but is there not also another stream here where people are waking up in in a particularly vivid way now with social media because of social media, which is causing this Westernization, but nevertheless now giving us real time access to what's actually happening. On the ground and so there's a counteracting force a, a disillusionment with the west as well as an attraction to the west so it is a bit more complicated um yeah i i, I absolutely i agree and i i, I mean i i do and i felt for a, a, quite a long time now i think there is this growing disconnect with with governments not just western governments i hasten to add i think also uh, governments in, in the east and in the in, in the arab nations as well i think there is a growing disconnect between government decisions and and the citizens on the street. And I think we are seeing this over the, the catastrophe of what's happening in Gaza and Palestine as a whole, in the West Bank as well, yes. that we are, we are seeing a, a growing awareness among citizens of all cultures and all faiths, different parts of the world, really seeing injustice for what it is. Mm, yeah. And I, I think the frustrating thing for so many people so many of us is this disconnect between between the the, the government speak of, of so many nations and, and what the person on the street is feeling when we see the unfolding tragedy, the unfolding genocide that's happening in Palestine that we have been aware of for decades, of course, um, but is now under the full glare of, of the TV cameras and social media across the globe. And I think this has brought about a real, an awakening, a reawakening of, of the political situation of Palestine, but also I think a spiritual uh, reawakening as people begin yes. to explore Islam and, and begin to witness the incredible Iman, the incredible faith of a people under yes. extreme conditions. Exactly, exactly that. There is a revival of interest in, in Islam in the West because of this, particularly amongst young people who 
I, I just, uh, as we all are, uh, amazed at the the great faith, the fortitude uh, of people under extreme uh, conditions, extreme oppression and injustice, and their faith is shining, is shining through. Uh, and and, th and this speaks to the reality of of, of Islam, of course. Um, yes. Yes. But just coming back to embracing Islam yourself, yeah. uh, you had a status before uh, in, in Britain as uh, of, of privilege or of, of leadership, and then you become a Muslim in, in, a, in a different landscape. Um, is there a sense still that you have white privilege uh, as, as a Muslim? Uh, is this something that you're aware of? And if so, how does it play out in, in your life? Yes, it's interesting. It's something that isn't really spoken about, but certainly uh, my experience on embracing Islam as a white, blue-eyed blue, blue -eyed, uh, British guy. Blue eyes? I wasn't sure. I didn't know you were blue eyes. Yeah, they mentioned it. You are. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. And I think, I think yes, I, I was treated um, with a great deal of um, joy and respect. Mm. There was even a sense of, uh, of people wanting to use me as a trophy, uh, as this person who had embraced Islam um, and, and also coming here now in Egypt and now in Oman mm. I think it's fair to say that my experience as a white male embracing Islam may be quite different from somebody with brown or black skin How, how so? How, how, how would you characterize that difference then? What, 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 is, what is this? I, I think um, I'm, I'm treated with a great deal of uh, almost almost reverence um, I am invited into people's homes. People are genuinely overjoyed that uh, a Western uh, man, white man, has, has, has become a Muslim. And I think racism, this, this subtle and not so subtle racism, I think shoots through all, all cultures, all religions. And although many Arabs will deny it, I think racism certainly exists within the Arab world as it does in the West. And so I find my experience um, is quite different to many others. Mm. Um, I'm married, I'm married to a black hijabi woman. She's been a Muslim all her life. And particularly in London or in, in the UK, um, through being alongside her, I experienced um, the, 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 the subtle and micro aggressions that she would have to face um, on a weekly basis, being number one, a black woman, and also an hijabi woman, um, that, that Islamophobia and racism that can often be experienced by, by people of color, really, again, taught me um, my, own, my own unconscious privilege, um, which I have carried around with me all my life and never really questioned. Mm -hmm. um, so, so my relationship with her uh, has also allowed me to, again, uh, relearn um, what I believe to be um, everybody's uh, experience of the world, which of mm. course it isn't. Um, so I am very much aware of my white privilege now, uh, certainly as a, as a Muslim. And of course, as you said, most Muslims live outside of Europe, outside of uh, the, the, the US. Uh, and so again, having experienced Muslims in East London, in Morocco, in Egypt, and in Oman, I, I have been humbled really by, by their level of generosity, uh, their level of insight, and they're often not given a voice in society, within the media, mm -hmm. particularly the Western media. Um, we have a very selective um, news covering um, in the West, and I'm certainly seeing that now with the coverage of, of Palestine. Yes. So I think all of that uh, has allowed me to see my my privileged status and position as a Muslim, but of course, when I when I converted or reverted, I lost that sense of leadership, that sense of status as a as a Christian leader, um, and as a priest, and and I became like a child, mm. uh, and I think that's the experience of so many converts to Islam, particularly mm. in the West, that we are entering into a, a culturally different landscape we're having to learn uh, again and i did feel like a child um, trying to fumble my way through this new theological and cultural landscape and even living in london i was in east london and i was surrounded by many mosques 
Uh, but of course, but of course, my experience would be, which mosque do I go to? And uh, would I go, for example, to the Ghanaian mosque or the Turkish oh, mosque or I the Bangladeshi it. mosque? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so there wasn't really a place where I felt really comfortable as a, mm -hmm. as a white British convert. The mm -hmm. only place that came close would be London Central Mosque. Regent's Park Mosque. Yeah, that, that's why I, I said my jihad. That's where I go to. Yeah, it's much more... Yes. Nice multicultural i think in many ways. yes much more international um yeah. uh, also more arab i have to say oh. um, and so that that allowed me to see a much more international community um but i i think certainly for me uh in those early days and years it can be difficult for new muslims to really know where they belong mm -hmm. but but i think that's now beginning to change as there are more british um converts to islam and and i think over time and even now i think there is a new identity that's beginning to emerge of so this what, what new identity how, how, what form does this take this emerging british muslim identity do you think i i, I think it, it's a convergence of of uh, adopting the the islamic religion and and and, and trying to navigate that whilst living and being brought up in a, very much a Western mm. society with with liberal values uh, and and trying to and of course you have issues of fashion uh, and literature and music and art and and how one begins to navigate that and incorporate aspects into that into one's faith and so I do feel there is beginning to be a distinctive British. Uh, Islamic um, identity that's forming. And I mm. think that will increase over time when we also begin to see, I think, emerging scholars mm. who have come out of that um, uh, landscape. Yeah. Uh, we, we have the likes of um, Dr. Uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, of course, who's very famous. But I, but I think over time there will be more yeah. who have been brought up in the UK, studied mm. in the UK, who will then emerge, I think, as uh, leading scholars um, from the West, not just the UK, but other mm. Western countries as well. And I think that that could be quite an exciting time for this growing Western uh, community of, of converts. Yeah, I've been very impressed with the caliber of the emerging uh, ulama, the Muslim yes. scholars in, in Britain uh, and in America, actually, uh, often centered around places like Cambridge Muslim College or Zituna College yes. uh, and other centers of intellectual excellence. And uh, some very impressive individuals I had the privilege to, to speak to. I mean, people who are very grounded in the Islamic tradition, the traditional sciences, as well as very literate in the Western yes. tradition. Yes, uh, and, and they are bilingual in, in that set, completely at home in both traditions. And before that was quite rare. I mean, you mentioned um, yes. uh, Abdul Hakim Rad, Tim Winter certainly was, and before him there was Guy Eaton. The, but yes. these were individual individuals, quite exceptional. But now I'm seeing a whole group of people, you know, uh, uh, pursuing yeah. academic excellence. And they have a, a very nuanced relationship with the West. They're not in any way assimilating in an uncritical way to secularism was at all, far from it. Uh, they have this robust position, but they're nuanced and they know yes. how to, to speak the language of the West, uh, uh, whilst at the same time remaining true to their tradition, their Islamic tradition. So they're very, I'm really encouraged, I'm very optimistic actually, uh, in yes. in this perhaps one area, not many other areas uh, at the moment, uh, uh, for, for the f future of, and it's not just British Muslim identity, but for uh, uh, mm. other aspects of Europe as well. Um, yes. So yeah, I, I, it's 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 good. I, I, I like that early on. You said you uh, this phrase you came up with: uh, "unlearn in order mm. to learn." I like that. I can certainly identify with having to unlearn, and that's something mm. I've had to confront recently when I've been traveling a lot uh, abroad, yes. and uh, I've uh, I've noticed because um, I, I speak to other Muslims uh, who are not white and and their experience of travel, going through immigration, mm. passport control. And it's very different for them, uh, actually. Uh, and this is always what they say, that they get stopped and asked questions and it takes a time. And even going to the Muslim world, you know, uh, and I've not experienced that. I really haven't, whether it be to the States or to the Arab world. I, I'm usually just kind of straight through, you know, a couple, a couple of routine questions in 30 seconds, I'm through. And that's not the experience of non-white Muslims. Yes. And, and this for me has awakened me to the 
um, unofficial but real racial hierarchy that uh, operates um, everywhere, uh, even though officially yes. it doesn't exist. Um, Absolutely. And, 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 yes, that's right. Yeah, they're just uh, talking to, to people in conferences and hotels and so on who I met. And extraordinary stories, and they're, they're consistent, they're always the same. So I can't deny this is factual because it's just the testimony is so universal. Yeah, ab absolutely, and of course, and of course, that goes wholly against, of course, the the, the teachings of, of Islam. Uh, and and you know, you mentioned uh, your experience, and here's just here's just one one experience where mm. some years back here in Oman, I I happened to be passing a very large wedding. That happens, and and here in this culture, um, the weddings are celebrated by the men outside in huge marquees. Mm -hmm. There can be dancing, uh, traditional dancing, um, and so I was with my small son at the time, and we stopped our car, and we went over to have a look, and I was immediately invited into the large tent, uh, mm -hmm. given food, and treated with great respect. At the same time, it just so happened that my Boab, uh, the, the young Bangladeshi uh, man who looked after our building, happened to walk by. And I saw him and I waved and he came over and uh, I invited him to sit next to me. And clearly uh, for many at the wedding, <laughs> this was not something that uh, was uh, uh, should have happened. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there was this awkward moment where he was um, uh, ushered out of, of the tent. And that made me feel deeply uncomfortable as a Muslim uh, man, understanding the Islamic notion of equality, uh, uh, regardless of color. <clears throat> and so that was just, that's just one example. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and as you say, there are countless uh, others uh, that we can experience uh, again in Egypt, uh, in, in, in Cairo, we have the Boab, which is in every block of flats. Uh, somebody um, who's generally poor, who looks after the building, lives in a small flat at the bottom. And I was invited to sit with his family for tea. And, and as, the, as the, uh, the, the people came into the building, um, into, their, into their flats, uh, they looked down at me on the floor eating with this family and they were quite frankly, shocked and horrified uh, that I should be sitting um, with, with this family. And, and so that, that makes you feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think um, certainly within um, many countries, although they will be quick to deny it, I, I think racism pervades all cultures and mm -hmm. all religions and Islam sadly is no exception. Mm -hmm. No, and and I, I think without going off the point too too much, I become more aware of the the West supremacist and even white supremacist yes. attitude when it comes to uh, non-white peoples like the Palestinians. Uh, yes. Comparing that with say Ukrainians who are yes. perceived as one of us, I white Europeans, and where they have been welcomed into our homes here in Britain as refugees. Yes. Um, when it comes to Syrians and others, is a, a very different sense. And of course, officially, there's no utterance but the 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 uh the difference in treatment is palpable and obvious uh, and uh and it's not Absolutely. normally remarked upon officially at all but it's it's a, a big reality yes. and, and and of course you know th there's this huge colonial legacy uh, and again i yeah. i began to be introduced uh, uh, at uh, at theological college with this whole uh, history and european uh, colonial legacy which mm. continues to be imprinted mm. upon the psyches of, of white and black uh, yes. across the world. Uh, and so, and, and I do find it incredibly rich when I see the likes of the British government making these holier than now statements on various parts of the world yes. without really understanding their own part and their own legacy in, in some of the issues that we face today. Yeah. Yeah, I felt that a bit nauseating, and particularly in, in the, yes. the media, the more conservative media that mock the, the idea or to deride the idea that there should be any issues with colonialism today. It, it's sort of seen as a left wing fetish. It's not taken seriously at all, but it's very much a living reality. Uh, and, and the other thing to do, again, a very specific example with the, for example, the British Museum, this great free the ah, yes. in the heart of London, which I remember a year or two ago had the an LGBT flag proudly flying from its top of the building, you know, so identifies with this woke cause. 
I mean, uh, that's not my point about the wokeness. The point is that the building is stuffed full of <laughs> colonial yes. treasures. Uh, most of them are, have, have, were never were taken when Britain was a colonial power. Egyptian things, particularly uh, obelisks and whatnot, which is taken, you know. And and there's a sense of this bizarre juxtaposition of wokery on the one hand and colonial arrogance and that we're keeping these goods. Why? Because, well, they're in our property. We're going to keep them forever. Because we, 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 we the, usually, the, re, the reason is often given, well, we, we're taking good care of them here. We're not sure they'll be taken good care of back in Egypt, which is deeply offensive, particularly mm -hmm. as they just built this huge, whopping, great big museum in Cairo to house yes. these things in the yes. first place. Uh, state of the art as well. Anyway, that's another subject. But you, you get this kind of weird kind of juxtaposition mm -hmm. of, of kind of left-wing trendiness and sort of colonial supremacism operating yes. at the same time. <laughs> Very English. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the, the double standards. Yeah. You, you, I think I, I, as a Muslim, certainly you really begin to see those double standards much, much more mm -hmm. deeply. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they talk of, of tolerance and, and liberalism, but I, I think it's tolerance on their grounds, yes. uh, within their own um, boundaries and with own, within their own standards. Uh, and so I, I, I do find that sometimes deeply hypocritical uh, and and frustrating at times when when I do see that um, that double standard in a whole range of issues. Yeah. And, I, and I think what, I, what I've experienced in the Islamic world mm. is, again, this this sense of community cohesion. Um, collective responsibility over individual responsibility. Right. And, and that's one of the big differences I found mm -hmm. having lived um, in, in Morocco, Egypt, Oman, is there's a much deeper sense of my actions have a bearing upon the wider community and the wider society. Mm -hmm. so, so that overrides my individual desires. Mm -hmm. um, and I've come to really respect that because it, it creates a stability and a peace and a cohesion, which I think has been lost in, in the West. Yes. Um, and so I, I, I have found that living here, um, one, one example would be, of course, um, the idea of alcohol. Right. Um, yeah. it's, very, it's very difficult for me to drink alcohol here. I can if I go to a, a five-star hotel, but mm. alcohol is not visible. Now, mm. I may enjoy drinking alcohol, um, I may enjoy it. I want it. But as a Muslim, it's the idea that I will forego. I will forego what I like for the for the health of the wider, larger community, not mm. only my family, but the society. Mm. And I, I think that's one really good example um, of, of yeah. collective responsibility. I have a responsibility for my own self but also for my brothers and sisters in the wider community. Mm -hmm. And so I will forego something like this for the wider good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a notion that isn't really understood within Western society. No, there's obviously, you know, much more uh, emphasis on the individual choice in a very kind yes. of selfish, egotistical sense. You know, I want, I want. And uh, other people sort out... The consequences of my actions if, if alcohol is freely available but let the weak go to the wall you know it's, it's their responsibility it's a terrible attitude of, of there's, there's no sense of social collective responsibility for the general common good it's yes. it, it's uh you know oh, it's, it's, if they can't handle the alcohol that's their problem we, we, we must yes. all have free access to it well whatever happened to looking uh you know loving your neighbor and caring for the yes. social it's yes. not there. um yes I, and and i think there's and i think there's this even now with the encroaching, encroaching Western values uh, arriving here, there is still this very deep sense of being accountable to God. Right. Um, and you really, you really feel it here that my actions are not only accountable in this life, but will it be accountable in the next? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's very, very much still alive and well in this part of the world. And I've experienced it here. Um, so again, my actions, they might be hidden, by others, um, but they will be one day known and revealed. And I think that also creates an incredible sense of stability and peace and cohesion. Um, mm. And, and it, it is extraordinary here, the, the, the level of sense of belonging to, to the wider society and having a part to play in that. 
And this is something that the, 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 the West, of course, really needs to learn from and benefit from for its own good, actually, uh, and not arrogantly assume it's superior to the rest of the world. But, but it has these immense treasures, these riches, spiritual riches and mm -hmm. social riches that it can yes. uh, very, I, I think they once, they once did exist in Europe. This is not alien, yes. but yes. they're part of the European heritage. Uh, so we're, in a sense, encouraging the West to remember its own heritage, but also in, in Islamic form, which is a purified, I would say, a purified form of uh, spirituality. But nevertheless, it comes, it's similar. Um, so this is something the West really needs to, I guess it comes with the humility and willing to listen. And we're not very good at that in the West as we're busy lecturing the world about, you know, the way, the world, the way the yes. world is. But yeah, and, and, and going back to my time as a, as a healthcare chaplain, what I came to understand as well is you, you, cannot, you cannot replicate human compassion with systems. Mm. And, so, and so what, I, what I've found in, in the West and certainly within the NHS, and, and I met some amazing, amazing professionals working within the NHS mm -hmm. and indeed within the church, some, some really holy people um, wishing to, to serve and, and, and help society. Mm. But what I've found in the West is as Christianity has been in, in serious decline, what we see now is, is very much secular systems of, of governance, of welfare, mm. that are there to, to support and offer um, care to the individual. But what I think has happened is we have been enslaved by the systems. Mm. So one example would be my, my wife's experience of giving birth in, in the UK and giving birth here in Oman. Oh, yeah. Two very different experiences the UK had the technology, um, had uh, the, the 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 staff, and so on, but there was there was a lack of compassion. Here, less technology, um, less advanced, but the care that she received from her Sudanese midwife and others was outstanding. Gosh. And so there, I feel is the difference. So you can have all the systems in place, all the pathways of care in place. Um, but what happens is you can end up ticking the boxes yes, yes, yes. and not really, not really caring for the individual. And so what would happen here if somebody was experiencing misfortune, organically, the local community would come together, gather together and offer financial or practical help to that person. Mm -hmm. And it would happen almost organically. I think that's been lost in, in certain Western societies. Yeah. So we have, we have systems in place, we have the welfare system, but it's administered with a great deal of, I would say, uh, malice or, or uncaring attitude. And I experienced that when I was working for the Quakers. Um, I was working for a groundbreaking charity offering care to those who could not afford a funeral for their loved ones. Right. And so I, I would assist them as they rang the government's um, helplines, um, applying for loans, a government loan to, to, to bury their loved one. Um, mm. and, and, and often we would meet um, very uncaring voices at the other end of the line who, who lacked real compassion and understanding of that person's situation. Um, and so, again, over time, I began to see these cracks mm -hmm. in, in systems and in society in the West that, yeah. that I began to question. Um, yeah. And I think the Islamic world has something very precious about this sense of caring for your brother and sister. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that happens organically out of one's uh, faith tradition. And mm. that's still very much present here, which I value. Amazing, absolutely, deeply fascinating. And I'm, I'm, I'm particularly the, the way, where your wife experienced, uh, you know, gi giving birth in those two very different contexts. Extremely telling, actually. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, and um, I, I, I did, I did find that. And as a chaplain, I had this incredible privilege of entering the space. Um, with a huge amount of freedom, I have to say, to mm. to offer that presence, that that non-judgmental presence, mm. to be alongside someone often in, in the most difficult periods of of immense grief or shock, mm. uh, and being that bridge. 
between the the NHS professionals and and the patient. Mm. Uh, and I think uh, chaplains of all faiths have this uh, immense privilege of being there and and being a voice often to those who feel like they don't have a voice mm, mm. Um, and, I, and I, I did see that time and time again within the NHS an amazing institution incredible people working within it um, working almost to breaking point and, mm. and I know that I experienced burnout towards the end um, because I think the system itself is crumbling Mm. And, and and like governments around the world, I think the status quo cannot continue for much longer because no. I think there is a groundswell of dissatisfaction, frustration, dare I say anger now, mm -hmm. where, where we are not being listened to for a whole variety of issues. Yes, I was just thinking, um, actually, that's potentially I was a different subject. I don't want to go there now, but... but mm. I just read in the paper yesterday a leading forecaster was saying that they're uh, predicting in the next year the rise of right-wing populist yes. politics in Europe as a response to this perceived yes. lack of, of the system not working and listening mm. to people's needs. Uh, with Trump almost certainly going going to be elected to the White House, yes. uh, countries like Germany and France and others, I think predominantly most countries uh, are predicted to uh, uh, either elect or have close second runners. Uh, people of the so-called populist right in, in Germany, yes. for example. Uh, we have Gert Wilders in, in Holland, yes. who is the prime minister-elect, of course, Italy, etc. So uh, although perhaps you're pointing to real problems, uh, the way they are, the solutions that are, are being sought for them in Europe, at least, may not be yes. uh, very friendly to uh, minorities in Europe. No, yeah, and I, I do think there is a growing vacuum, really, mm. that, that allows, um, you know, the likes of, of Trump, as you say, to to no doubt, and I'm sure, I'm sure it's going to be re-elected. Um, and, and also, of course, Biden's um, perceived weakness um, over Palestine, I think, has really um, uh, frustrated and angered a lot of Muslims in America, who mm. I think will no longer vote for him. Uh, and, and I think it's a sign, the sadness of our times, when we have the choice of Trump or Biden, or, or Rishi Sunak or Sakir Starmer, yeah. uh, I, I think it's, it, it, it tells a lot, really, of the state of our politics, mm. where we yeah. have the, lab, the leader of a Labour Party refusing to call for a total ceasefire in Palestine. It's going to, give, it's going to do him electoral damage, there's no question. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, who do we vote for? <laughs> so, you know, there's no there's no clear alternative. No, um, exactly. And I, I think there is this vacuum. The extreme right certainly will take its place. Um, and, and I think uh, for, for those of us very much against this, uh, we need to, to raise our voices uh, more, mm -hmm. certainly. Indeed. Um, drawing perhaps to a, a close, uh, yes. we don't have unlimited time. Um, <laughs> Are, are there books and resources that you might want to talk about that you found useful, uh, actually? Uh, in yeah, yeah I, I think you're going to put a list uh, underneath yeah. the video when it comes up. And it's quite an eclectic list, not not all by Muslims, I have no. to say. Um, but yeah, I, I found a whole number of resources really good. I particularly mentioned a, a book which is not really well known which is The Butterfly Mosque by G. Willow Wilson. She is a young American woman who traveled to Cairo and she embraced Islam. Uh, and it's partly a love story between her and her Egyptian husband, but it's an incredibly articulate exploration of what it means for a Western person to embrace Islam and, and how one adopts that theologically, but also culturally. And, and she explores these difficulties of interfacing between Western, uh, Western upbringing and a very Eastern Islamic uh, culture of being in the center of, of Egypt. Uh, well, and that's, that's, really, that's a really good book to, to read. And, and somebody, some people might raise their eyebrows because I put down there a, a film, a movie to watch, The Last Samurai. <laughs> um, is, this which is, Tom, is this the Tom Cruise film? It is. It's quite old now. I think it's about 20 years old. Mm. But I think that's a really beautiful film that explores yeah. somebody coming from the West with their yeah. 
preconceived ideas and notions of superiority. The Tom, the Tom Cruise character. Yes, yes. And he enters, he enters this traditional yeah. Japanese culture mm. and it's, it explores how his construct and his narratives and his prejudices are, are slowly dismantled by yeah. his experience. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful film exploring yeah. how assumptions can be challenged and how you can unlearn in order to learn and yeah. how he finally embraces this new culture. I think yeah. it's a really, a really beautiful film exploring those, those issues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, so there are um, some good uh, some good books. There's a there's a, a new a fairly new book exploring the experience of being a white person within Islam, and that's the Invisible Muslim um, by Medina Whiteman, uh, and she she talks about this this white privilege and being an in, incognito Muslim. Um, <laughs> when I when, when I walk down the street, nobody knows, of course, that I'm a Muslim. Here, here in Oman, they will assume I'm not. Yes. Uh, and, and so there can be an element of surprise, shock or joy when people realize that I'm a Muslim. Well, for, for hijabi women, of course, um, they don't have that incognito privilege. They are there as soon as they open the door. Uh, and that brings, that brings uh, expectations. It brings difficulties as well as opportunities. I think so. Yeah. That's also a good book uh, yeah. to read, and there are, and of course, there are many others. I'm a great fan of the author Leila Abu Leila. She is a Scottish Sudanese writer, yeah. and she she wrote a, a beautiful collection of stories called Elsewhere Home, which explores the experience of second and third generation Muslims living in the UK. Um, and I find her writing to be extremely tender, moving and insightful, um, exploring themes around identity, um, of exploring where one is in the world, um, certainly as a second or third generation Muslim arriving in the UK. She, she's a really good writer that I would recommend. She's written a number of novels and, and short stories. Um, so I would recommend her as well. There, there is a, a recent novel, again, not by a Muslim, Babel by R.F. Quang, which is set in Oxford, Oxford University yeah. in okay. the 1800s. And that explores the experience of a Chinese, a young Chinese boy arriving from China, enters into this very precious ivory tower world of Oxford and how over time he begins to question the, the, the entire establishment of which he now belongs. Um, and that's an incredibly good novel that explores wow. it. And one, one of the protagonists is Muslim. Um, and so that explores again, assumptions made um, about uh, foreigners in, in the Western world. Uh, it's also a very good book. I noticed you included a book by uh, Chomsky, Noam Chomsky called Gaza in oh, Christ. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, is that, that particular one on that particular subject? Uh, what, yes. What, what, there are many books on Gaza. Uh, what, yeah, there are there, there are many, and and I mean, I mean, he's somebody that I've read over many years, uh, yeah. long be long before I was even a Muslim, uh, yeah. and it, I mean, it's a little bit dated now, but I think he explores the the origins of of this of this and the history of this crisis in great detail, uh, mm -hmm. and also and and also writes about the daily the daily humiliations and the daily oppression really of a people that have, that has gone on for decades. Uh, mm. And you, you mentioned uh, the experience of, of black and brown people arriving at airports around the world. But of course, mm. Palestinians experience that at checkpoints mm. every day of their lives. Uh, and and uh, again, I think um, many people are only waking up to, to the history of, of, uh, of that, part of the world now through through this unfolding catastrophe that's, that's happening for the Palestinians. Indeed, indeed. Well, perhaps we'll, we'll leave it there, but thank you very much uh, indeed uh, you. for your time. And I, I will um, put uh, a list of the books and resources uh, that you've sent me in the description below so you can read these uh, amazing works. Uh, the Last Samurai film, I, it's definitely worth watching. And also a YouTube uh, video, Finding Joe, um, 
which you can yes. discuss yourself as well. Yeah, that, that, that's again that that's that that's not particularly Islamic, but I, I think this this notion by Joseph Campbell of the power of myth. Right. Uh, and, and and this idea he had of the hero's journey certainly helped me on my journey to become a Muslim. Mm. Um, because when I when I look at his idea of the hero's journey, I see my path of realization from becoming a Christian, a Christian priest, and then embarking upon this great unknown journey of embracing Islam. Mm. Um, and so I find his idea of the hero's journey really helpful in this particular documentary it was very useful for me as i as i made that decision to to become a muslim despite despite the 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 great anxiety the voices telling me to do otherwise uh, sure. but remaining remaining true to myself um a really good documentary fantastic well that's amazing uh thank you so much indeed yusuf for your time thank and you. thank uh, you so much Paul. thank you no, no, it's, been, it's been an immense pleasure and an education uh, to hear your your very interesting journey. And I'm sure many will benefit from it. So uh, thank you so much. Um, until next time. Salam alaikum. Thank you so much. Alaikum salam. Thank you, Paul.